and welcome to TBR's quarterly Tumba Mobility Vendor Benchmark Review. My name is Allison Crawford, and I will be your host for today's session. TBR's focus is to provide business research to accelerate our customer success, and the information we'll be covering today comes directly from our 2Q12 Telecom and Mobility Vendor Benchmark Report. This report includes information on vendor strategies, demographic growth, business events, and more. The our networking and mobility team delivers is invaluable to any firm with plans to expand their footprint or compete more effectively in the telecom infrastructure market. We're excited to present some of the findings to you and get your feedback on our information. Before I hand this over to Mike and Chris, there are a few action items I'd like to cover with you. First, we will be recording today's session and posting it to the TBR YouTube channel. We encourage you to visit our channel to watch this presentation or any of the others we've posted. We'd like to hear your opinions, thoughts, and questions on the materials we're presenting. Please send anything through the Q&A function or the chat function. Mike will address them at the end of the presentation. Third, we'll send out the slides to everyone registered for today's webcast within 24 hours of the conclusion of the webinar. Now, let me introduce research analyst Michael Soper and analyst Chris Antlitz from the networking and mobility team here at TBR. Mike is primary author of the Telecom and Mobility Vendor Benchmark, and Chris has been covering the telecom infrastructure service host market for the past five years. This team has been instrumental in assisting our clients to improve strategic go-to-market plans and improve performance. And with that, let me hand this over to Chris and Mike. Thanks, Allison. Welcome, everyone. This is so. The, what is the vendor benchmark? This is a quarterly report where we deep dive global basis across three key business segments. Infrastructure, applications, and services. And what we do is we benchmark leading vendors in each of those areas. We do uh, modeling of margins. We also do revenue growth. Some of the leading vendors that we cover are seen on the bottom. Their logos. You have usual suspects. Apple, uh, Alcatel, Lucent, Nokia, Siemens, Huawei. We have some of the devices. Uh, all our infrastructure players like Samsung um, and some of the software, more software-centric, services-centric firms like Accenture, IBM, HP. So each quarter we rank these companies across each of those segments and geos, and we provide commentary about key strategies and developments that are occurring uh, in the market in that quarter, driving growth for these, these companies. Uh, I'll hand it over to Mike Soper, who's going to jump into the infrastructure um, and the other business segments. Thank and thank you all for joining us today. So today's discussion, I'll be addressing the telecom infrastructure and applications markets, while Chris will speak about the telecom infrastructure services space. To start, so the big trends we've been seeing in the last quarter are that most vendors are struggling in the infrastructure market, and that's due to a pretty steep drop in demand and for uh, legacy technologies um, like GSM and CDMA, while seeing vendors perform better in the applications market, and that's because they're tackling uh, the opportunities in OSS, BSS transformation, uh, while they're also preparing for operator investment in customer experience management. The services market, and uh, Ericsson is really the clear market leader there, while NSN and Alcatel Lucent, they're facing some profitability issues, and, and that's that's really due to increased competition from Huawei. They've taken Huawei's taken um, share in some of the more commoditized services, uh, things like field maintenance. So, in the infrastructure market, is that as the market has slowed, vendors are ramping up investment in growth areas. Um, things like small cells, Wi-Fi, and TDLTE. Uh, expecting the small cell market to gain steam in the remainder of 2012 and into 2013. As the team operators, they look at capacity, um, coverage uh, to the network so that they can cope with the rise in data traffic. Initially, uh, the small cells will be equipped for a three, uh, 3G because that will be in highest demand. That's because legacy CDMA and HSP network they're more heavily congested than some of the fledgling LTE networks right now. Vendors um, um, Wi-Fi integrated small cells. In April of 2012, Ericsson closed its acquisition of Bell Networks, a carrier Wi-Fi company. NSN also reached 
reached a, a reseller agreement with uh, Chief Level Ruckus Wireless. And that was in May. Um, so, um, further about uh, LTE investment, that's, that's, that's peaked in some of the developed markets like the United States and, and South Korea. Um, whereas China and India, they really represent the next major 4G growth market. So in, in China and India, they'll deploy TLTE as opposed to FDD LTE, which has been more prevalent in North America and Europe. Um, and for vendors, the past TDLTE deployments are not likely to occur for the second half of 2013. That's at the earliest, uh, due to uh, regulatory hurdles and um, the Chinese and Indian governments making spectrum available. In the meantime, we're seeing vendors uh, build their TDLTE client base, um, like the Middle East, uh, also taking part in network trials. Um, the major tier one vendors, they're involved with China Mobile's TDLTE trial. So it's uh, infrastructure, revenue, and revenue growth in, in the summer of 2012. Now, on the whole, most of the vendors saw revenues fall from the year-ago period, um, and that's due to, like I said before, the operator spending on technologies like CDA and GSM has really decreased. Um, also, because of European operators, they're um, delaying some of their investment, uh, and that's due to the economic crisis. Um, now Huawei, which had you know, which had better growth than the vendors here, they were able to, able to overcome these obstacles uh, to its emerging markets customer base and an expansion into Europe and Canada, where it had uh, a pretty small customer base beforehand. In Canada, Huawei was able to, to score a couple of CE rollout deals with Telus and BCE. Revenue, uh, the leaders in the infrastructure market, that would be Huawei, Ericsson, and Alcatel Lucent. Uh, the only one, like I said, before, that was able to post growth was Huawei. Uh, and its growth had really slowed down from previous quarters. It was only 7.4% in the second quarter. Huawei hold a, a, pretty, a pretty dominant position among operators of, of all sizes in the Middle Eastern and African markets. And they leverage their ability to offer vendor financing and discounts on equipment in order to, in order to attain the market share in media. Uh, it's low price strategy. It's, it's also beginning to eat into the market shares of incumbents in Europe, especially uh, Alcatel Lucent and NSNs. Here we have Ericsson and Alcatel Lucent. Um, they're the dominant players in the CDMA market in North America. They've been hit by lower, uh, significantly lower demand for CDMA equipment at Verizon and Sprint. Um, uh, both of these operators have, have begun to really focus on their LTE build-outs. And while Ericsson and Alcatel Lucent um, will supply LTE equipment for Verizon and Sprint, the energy revenues have not yet made up for the, the steep drop in LTE. So if you're looking forward, and it's going to try to squeeze a bit more revenue from its European network modernization projects in this year. Um, and then they'll also see a boost in revenue in North America from uh, the T-Mobile USA uh, LTE contract, which it won alongside SN. Look at Alcatel Lucent. They, they are going to look for a revenue boost in early 2013 from some of its fixed deals, uh, which it won from China Telecom. Uh, as part of the Broadband China Initiative, and that's uh, China's aim to cover 800 million people with broadband access in the next few years. So we're moving on to the we move on to the application space. This uh, this is where vendors are, are concentrated on evolving the customer experience management market, and also to capitalize on demand for OSS BSS transformation. That's a, that's a potentially high growth market, but it isn't expected to really take off until 2013, while demand for OSS BSS, that exists right now. Take a look at applications revenue and revenue growth graph. You'll notice that Huawei leads, and that might come as a bit of a surprise, 
This application, that's really due to a high number of network management system installments. And that comes uh, along with the network rollouts, which they have a high number of because because of win with some of the smaller operators in, in emerging markets. Them, they also hold a, a very strong position in applications, and that's, uh, that's due to their focus on telecom operators, helping them evolve, evolve into cloud service providers. Uh, IBM's also focused on expanding its analytics offerings, and they've been uh, in a lot of uh, acquisition activity in the last few years to, to boost their capabilities there. Ericsson, they had the highest growth in applications. That was at 46% year to year. And a lot of that is inorganic due to the acquisition of Telcordia, but Ericsson's capitalizing on OSS BSS demand, so they would have grown uh, organically as well. If we look further into some of the application activities of specific companies, we have Alcatel, Lucent, NSN, and Ericsson. Um, Alcatel, Lucent, NSN, they're, they've been standouts in terms of communicating their DEM strategies. Alcatel, Lucent, in, in fact, they announced that they're leveraging their 2008 motive acquisition for a solution called uh, of Customers Experience Solutions, or Motive CXS. And that includes a mix of analytics, uh, device management solutions, and professional and consulting services. And so, and then if you look at NSN, they are planning to really uh, as their CEM solution as differentiator in the market. Um, they're going to emphasize uh, accessibility, analytics, and uh, target with they have to market with uh, different CEM delivery models. They can do CEM as a service uh, by leveraging their global network operation centers. They can also deliver it directly to customer. Um, so then they're also involved in the in a massive restructuring that includes substantial headcount reductions uh, as well as divestment divestments. They try to focus more on mobile broadband services and customer experience management. One of the business lines they're looking to divest is their BSS or billion systems unit and charging systems unit. Um, they could be missing out on a, a bit of an opportunity to provide BSS transformation to operators because operators are introducing new gazing models so that they can better monetize their subscribers. Now, they're expected to take full advantage of the, um, the OSS BSS transformation opportunity. Uh, then they'll leverage their newly acquired Telcordia assets to win a lot of these deals as the need for operators to update their back office systems increases. Uh, update on Ericsson's Telcord integration, the Telcord brand was officially phased out and all of its employees were transferred to either Ericsson's global services or support solutions units. So I've covered the infrastructure and applications markets and now I will hand it over to Chris who's going to cover service Services. services, two big things, two key things from 2Q12 to keep in mind. For LTE deployments, the major driver of the TIS, uh, the TIS industry in 2Q12, and the lead driver of that was operators in North America, Japan, and South Korea. The second key growth in TIS was outsourcing. And it is outsourcing. Outsourcing, uh, operators are really embracing outsourcing to reduce OPEX. Um, we're seeing operators across Europe, in part of MIA and in Ella, come to the vendors and say, oh, how can we, what can we do to get this OPEX down? So we've had operators already go through this network modernization where they're ripping out and replacing their legacy RAN with multi-mode RAN giving them a lower total cost of ownership on the uh, side of the, the mobile network, but now I want to look at things like, okay, should we, should we outsource our back office system? Should we outsource our OSS, user network elements? So there's a lot of opportunities here for vendors to come in and, and win some of this business. Nexon has been the biggest beneficiary 
of this, uh, not the outsourcing, also professional services and the, the maintenance and deployment of these new networks. Uh, had a very good growth quarter, yet again. Um, the growth in the past quarter was from Telcordia. However, if you exclude Telcordia's impact, Ericsson still grew at a double-digit rate year to year. So what is Ericsson doing? What are they doing right? And you know, how are they being so successful? Well, well Ericsson, they end to end uh, polio. It spans the OSBSS, the whole portfolio of that now. They have end-to-end -end infrastructure portfolio. Their strategy is to do services-led. So they come in with their services team, and they work with the operators, customize solutions for them, and then Ericsson pulls through sales of their equipment and software needed to implement those solutions. And their services team is overseeing and managing this whole process for them. It's a little different from a company like Huawei, who is more product-focused in their go-to-market strategy. Uh, they're learning, getting more uh, getting better at integrating the service team with the, the equipment team, that they're working together. But Ericsson has really mastered this and, and been very successful at, at it. Uh, also, to highlight Nokia Siemens and Alcatel Lucent um, had a top quarter year. There. That is, their, their strategies are changing. So, it, both companies are undergoing large restructuring programs right now. And the the, the theme is they're exiting low margin commoditized business where there's low ability to differentiate. So, uh, network operations, outsourcing, and field maintenance, field operations, those types of services, they're really starting to de emphasize. They're also going to de emphasize some countries that they don't generate a significant amount of sales from. And as well with Nokia Siemens, in, in a few quarters, they did their uh, OI contract in Brazil. That was a very large managed services contract. They decided to not renew it, uh, get out of that. So they were, they were losing on the contract. So that's, this is in line with um, their strategy to, yeah, who's going to fall. They might lose a little bit of market share, but they're more focused right now on the margin gain. In contrast, you have the, the Huawei's and ZTE's of the world who are doing the opposite. They're focused on market share. And they're okay accepting a low margin or taking a loss on a particular project if they have the ability to enter new customer accounts, increase their, uh, hold in those accounts, and maybe upsell customers into more uh, higher value, higher margin products and services and software. Ericsson, they're also just, uh, they're, they're kind of balancing between the two. So they are working to protect their customer base, so they want to sustain market share, but they want to stay profitable. So they're, they're you know, doing that services led approach, and that's really helping them maintain steady margins in the services end um, and helping to differentiate from Huawei ZTE. Uh, important that Huawei ZTE, their services businesses, if they're growing very fast, but they are lacking in some key areas that the, the, the Western incumbents have. So areas like consulting, which is multi-vendor systems integration, uh, the two areas where the Ericsson's, Avatel, Lucent's are able to differentiate and, and, and still derive a pretty good margin on that business. So with that, go a little bit about TR and how we, um, some of the topics that are weaved into our syndicated reports. So we do quarterly reports on all of the leading vendors globally. And, you know, every quarter we do an assessment of their quarterly earnings and get trends going on in the industry and we figure out where are these vendors placing, you know, where, where are they placing their bets. How are their business decisions working out? Strategies developing, evolving. Uh, some of the topics that we're looking at right now: customer experience management is key, and really a uh, big industry driver there. They're making some um, big announcements. Actually, just made some announcements today on some new on-demand uh, CE solutions. Why small cells? The whole net. How do the small cells integrate with macro networks? 
how we're going to look, what's the addressable market for small cells and Wi-Fi, who's, you know, where are vendors, how are trying to differentiate in that market. Also, services, we do a very deep analysis on each vendor's service business. We look at drivers of, of revenue and profit. They are investing to the roadmap to get to. So some of the higher value services, things like automation, um, expanding their consulting capabilities, et cetera. And, uh, that's another big theme we're looking at right now, particularly around small cells and how how you know the the, the we're going to run backhaul lines to the small cells in a cost-effective manner. Uh, the vendor right now looking at several different methods of doing that, um, and, and you know we're looking very closely at how that market's going to look. What are best practices? How operators going to you know how are these solutions going to look so that they are scalable and they will provide operators with the the cost efficiencies that they expect. We'll open up to questions. Great. Thanks, for Mike. Uh, we have a couple questions come in. I would like to encourage anyone that has any questions on what we just presented, please send them through. Um, the first one we got was, how does the Concept Wave acquisition impact Ericsson? So Concept Wave, so Airbot Telcordia uh, is actually a natural fit. Uh, the Concept Wave is a uh, they had worked very closely with Telcordia. They had a long-standing relationship with that company. They still do. And so Ericsson came in and said, hey, we're going to buy you guys, um, and we're going to integrate you with Telcordia because the two companies have worked so closely together. Their processes, et cetera, have, have already been well integrated. So it's just an actual fit into the portfolio, and it helps Ericsson get some more traction in uh, some customer accounts in, across EMEA and in the United States and Canada. Great. Second question that Ken is, will the CDMA market bounce back? So last few quarters, we've seen CDMA take a huge fall uh, on the order of 40 50% sales down year over year. Uh, much of that is baked into the market now. Um, that's going to level out. There's the key CDMA operators, there's one in China, I believe it's China Unicom, and then there's Sprint, uh, Sprint and Verizon. Those operators are prioritizing LTE right now. They are looking for ways to refarm spectrum on the CDMA network and start winding those operations down. So it's going to be a, more of a long-term thing. So in the meantime, um, these operators are going to need to maintain their existing cell sites. So there is still going to be demand for CDMA, uh, CDMA equipment. So it's going to be more of a long-term, gradual downtrend from here going forward. Next question to Ken. Uh, hold on. Announced renewed, renewed plus on IP products. Is the growth area in the industry as a whole, or Ericsson and Ericsson in particular? So yes, IP is a very good growing uh, space right now. The edge operators are more focused on the end routers right now building up the edge infrastructure, um, but they're also needing to make investments in the core. Uh, Sin is trying to position itself in that area. They have an edge router, the SSR family, and they use uh, partners like Juniper Cisco for the core router. So yes, routing is, is a growth area for Sin, but an absolute revenue basis, it's a very small business for them, but it's very fast. Okay. The next question that came in is, in regard to small cell deployments and maintenance in enterprise and public areas, i.e. airports, malls, etc., uh, who telecoms outsourcing this work to? The, so for third parties, there's companies that own works and then they sell capacity to operators. Uh, and they'll buy the services they need and the equipment they need fr directly from the vendors. So there's different business models that are developing around this, uh, also different monetization methods, um, you know, advertising. You advertise Wi-Fi for free in the airport. Many airports do that. 
um, and a common business model. Um, that's where the market's moving. Concerns are expecting you know, Wi-Fi and those types of things to be a complementary service. So um, the advertising model has been very popular. And you know, it's like Ericsson with their acquisition of Bel Air. You have NSN partnering with Ruckus Wireless, and you have Cisco with their own Wi-Fi offering. Um, there's a big push right now to extend that, use the Wi-Fi in conjunction with the cellular networks to optimize quality of service. Okay, the next question that came in is, what types of high-value services NSN and Alcatel-Lucent getting into to differentiate and boost margins? So Alcatel-Lucent, Nokia Siemens, they are looking at less on the labor-intensive services. So something like field maintenance is heavily labor-intensive and typical margin. What we're doing to, to move up the value chain is looking at automation, leveraging their global network operation centers, and you know putting in software that can run, that can do like fault management, alarm monitoring, those types of functions. Um, also implement automation into the OSS. Uh, which Ericsson is doing, and they're actually their acquisition of Omni uh, a few years ago gave them some, some assets in that area. Uh, some other value high margin services they're looking at expanding is consulting. Uh, that's, that's something where traditionally you have Accenture, IBM, HP providing those services. Now you have the vendors, the traditional NEPs coming in and saying, hey, we can do these consulting services for you. Um, and we can, you know, we guys the whole package, the whole life cycle of this project. So they come in with the consultants, do the design planning of the network, maybe optimization if they're doing a project around existing infrastructure, and the vendors can hold the operator's hand through the whole process. They provide all facets of the project for them. It's a very compelling offering that they're offering to the operators, um, and it has, has, has done very well for them thus far. Uh, we have another question about small cell installations. Um, actually doing the small cell AP installations on behalf of the telecom. So installations, it, it depends. It's, you can Ericsson, Alcatel, you know, the NEPs doing it. Uh, sometimes they'll tie it into a broader contract. Some will subcontract out to smaller um, deployment firms, maybe a tower company or a construction company, and they'll do the actual deployment of the boxes. Yeah, there's many different variables in there, but it's a mixture. It's, you know, the NEPs will do it directly, or they'll outsource it to someone else to do it for them, or the operator will outsource it to someone to do it for them, a uh, third B contractor, what have you. Great. Um, last question that's come in so far. Uh, so I want to thank Chris and Mike, and thank everyone who joined the call today. Uh, before we sign off, there's a couple of things that I'd like to mention. Um, first, we have a couple of additional webinars that may be of interest to you or people you uh, on your teams. Uh, we'll be doing a U.S. and Canada mobile operator benchmark on October 16th, and we're going to be doing a deep dive into Huawei and their strategies on November 14th. So please be uh, on the lookout for those invitations coming out. If you'd like to get more information, you can reach out directly to either Chris or Mike, um, and their email addresses are on the screen up, uh, in front of you around. Additionally, you can follow them on Twitter for um, up-to-date opinion insight on you know, the reset we're working on, the breaking news in the industry, and follow um, what they're interested in working on uh, over the next couple of weeks and months. I think the chat folks should be open for five minutes to give you a, an additional chance to lob any additional questions into the analysts. Uh, you can also follow up with them uh, at you know, a later date if you'd like to, to send them an email. And we're doing this webinar again next week. Quarter, so we look forward to seeing you in Q34. Have a great afternoon. Bye.